Welcome. Are we on? Yep. Welcome to those on YouTube and social media. We pray a blessing upon you this day. All right. Do you guys understand the days of infamy? The days of infamy. Now, if you don't, you would be within the majority, uh, and especially the younger generation that we see. But hopefully by the end of today, we will understand those days. Uh, a few years ago, I asked the question, what does it take for a nation to wake up, to become aware, to become sensitive to? What has to happen for a people to turn from their self-centered, egocentric, self-honoring lifestyles? What would it take? We are all reminded this next week what may have to happen for a nation to wake up. Several years in the American history have defined us, and they have uh, brought us to the state where we know, did know, who we were. We were. With that, this Tuesday, you may understand or may know, maybe you have to be older to understand it, is the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, 7 December, 1941. President Franklin D. Roosevelt proclaimed December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy because the attack happened without de declaration of war and without explicit warning. The attack on Pearl Harbor was judged by the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals as a war crime. Uh, <coughs> Most of us in 1941, uh, at least if you're close to that region, okay, uh, you kind of remember it. Okay, it was a past event that had some very defining characteristics of the United States. Called by our president at that time, infamy. Infamy is a state of being well known for some bad quality or bad deed. Or deeds. Now is it one day of infamy or is it days of infamy? Days of well-known bad qualities or deeds. And hence the title of the message you know that I believe it's not one single day, it's many days that attribute to that. These actions this day, December 7th, will live perpetually as a time of remembrance for the bad quality and bad deeds of the Japanese people. And some of oh, pastor, you can't say that. That would be wrong. No, that's what it was. And so it was the, the declaration of that. 90 minutes from the time it began to the time it was over. 90 minutes. It wasn't even a whole day. It's an hour and a half. That defines us. 2,008 sailors were killed. 710 others wounded. 218 soldiers and airmen who were part of the Army uh, at that time, Army Air Corps it was actually called, uh, were killed. 364 wounded. 109 Marines were killed. 69 wounded. 68 civilians were killed. 35 wounded. In total, 2,403 Americans died. Almost 1,200 were wounded. 18 ships were sunk or ran aground, including five battleships. This attack this day led the United States' entry into World War II. Uh, obviously, with Japan, Italy, Germany, uh, it just involved all kinds of people. Uh, the then new coming president, Harry S. Truman, he ordered within his tenure, within four years, <coughs> the nation of Japan to surrender. Surrender. 
During the final stage of World War II, the United States detonated two nuclear weapons over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and August 9th, respectively, 1945. And the United States dropped the bombs after obtaining the consent of the United Kingdom as required by the Quebec Agreement. The two bombings killed 129,000 and 226,000 people, most of whom were civilians remains and they remain the only use of nuclear weapons in the history of warfare. You see a nation had elevated itself uh, to a specific position. Pride, egocentric behavior, self-centeredness caused them to attack us. Isn't it odd? We were fine with that. You see if this was the chronology, if this was the year today, uh, here we are on Sunday, worshiping the Lord, getting ready for Christmas. We're going to celebrate a month of understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he has done and how he has brought to us the greatest gift that God could give mankind. And we're celebrating that, and we've been celebrating that. They were celebrating it in Hawaii. I don't know how they do that with no snow, but there is a mountain that gets snow. I'm hoping we'll have snow. A little bit, not on the roads. <laughs> uh, that's what they were doing. That's what. They were doing. Think of you, especially those of you that would then go to work on Tuesday. You come from your house, you go to work on Tuesday, and then your life is destroyed and changed forever. Someone knew that was going to transpire. Someone had planned that that's what was going to transpire. They were going to exterminate you on Tuesday. Now, people didn't know that was going to transpire. This nation had then come to grips after the nuclear bombs with... Do you really want a war with the U.S.? Do you really want a war with Russia? You know, your people, vast amount of them, are bombed and scattered. Truman told the people, surrender or face prompt and utter destruction. Surrender or you'll be destroyed. I rather like that. They obviously choose not to surrender, okay? Not initially, but then after those two bombs and that command goes forth, they go, okay, we quit. We surrender. Japan announced its surrender to the Allies on August 15th, six days after the bombing of Nagasaki and the Soviet Union, Union's declaration of war. On September 2nd, the Japanese government signed the instrument of surrender, effectively ending World War II. Okay. What would it take for a nation to wake up? This had tremendous implications for us. You see, this, World War II, led us into the Korean War. We were then led into the Vietnam War. Then we had September 11th which propelled us at the death of 3,000 people. The war on terrorism has lasted to today. Finally, in August of this year, the government surrendered several hundred American citizens in Afghanistan to the Taliban. And I chose that word surrendered very carefully because that's what it was. Here we are, 80 years later, still fighting the global war on terror. Now, there's two interesting things that I think occurred. Pearl Harbor and September 11th had the same result. They unified a nation. Korea, Vietnam, and Afghanistan divided our nation. Today, Lawlessness and terrorism 
domestically on our own soil. They attack all of our major cities right now are under attack. A plague of violence and terrorism. Uh, these truly are days of infamy. They truly are days that are upon us. Now, all we have to think about is how are we going to respond to all of that? And some people said, well, just move. And many hundreds of thousands of people have moved out of the major cities because of they're not fit places to live anymore. In fact, the major cities on our west coast, Seattle, Portland, Francisco, Los Angeles, all of those places, uh, most people that have any kind of knowledge at all, go. those places are ruined. They're destroyed. They are burnt. They are broken. They have a state of lawlessness. They have a state of terrorism that exists. Now, if that was some foreign thing, do you think we would be allowing that? But you see, it's divided up. How could you be divided? Hey, we're going to burn up your city. Oh, okay. We think that's okay? These days continue to divide us. Our culture continues to divide us. Turn this morning to the Gospel of Mark, if you would. Our text for today, Mark chapter 3. Because I want you to know that days of division have always been around since the time of Christ, even before that. They have been there. They are there. So there was the response that we have. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, ah, there it is. Chapter 3, verse 20. Some interesting things have been taking place. Jesus has been even casting out demons. He has selected the apostles or disciples at this time. Verse 20, he came home and the multitude, multitude gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. There are so many people, they can't even have lunch. It's rather like us when we start service. They can't even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of him, heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. For they were saying, he has lost his senses. Some translations say he's out of his mind. So that you might be familiar with this, his own people, is Jesus' family. His family, according to Matthew 13, when they said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? See, brother, Jesus has these stepbrothers, four of them, to be exact, Mary's other siblings. Uh, I know some religious groups like to keep Mary a virgin forever. Uh, that wasn't the plan. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is conceived, and we're going to speak of those things uh, in the next several weeks, clear to the date of his birth. Conceived by God not by man. God's plan. But yet God blessed his family with more children. They are indeed a blessing. Now why did Jesus' family, Mary, James, Simon, and Judas, why did they come to him that day? Well, it was simple. They believed he had lost his mind. He's crazy. He's insane. Maybe it was because Jesus was embarrassing them speaking of things that they were, they were unfamiliar with, healing people, wow, that was amazing, casting out demons, wow, that's amazing. And then he's talking. He's talking these things of God which are totally contrary to the culture and even to his own family. And so, does Jesus embarrass you? 
Do you believe the words of Jesus are an expression of an insane mind? The expression of a lunatic? I know most all of you say, no, not at all. Any mind that is contrary to the mind of Jesus, that mind is insane. And in fact, we'll use that mind in a moment. Verse 22, the scribes who came, to, this is Mark 3, came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And so they start to say, yeah, Mary, yeah, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, yeah, he's insane. In fact, he's demon-possessed. And he's casting out demons by demons. And so, is the work of Christ good or evil? Is it right or wrong? Do you suppose this is just a cultural thing? Or is this the word of truth? Is this the way it is? This is absolute ground truth. Jesus calls him to himself in verse 23 speaking to them in parables. Brother Mike is teaching parables on Sunday morning. Great job uh, explaining a parable. And for those of you in the study, you know this. It's a form of teaching where you take something people know about and you describe that to help them understand things they don't know about. You take a physical teaching, a physical reality, and you turn that into a spiritual reality. Is the spiritual world real? They thought so. Jesus thought so. I think so. As he's there and they are spewing this out of their mouth. You know there's a lot of people today that speak that Christianity is an evil. That Christianity is hate speech that because it is not inclusive of every form of sin on the planet, that it's somehow restrictive in nature, and that it is unreasonable, and in fact it is too narrow. And Jesus would agree. The gate, the path, the way to God is narrow. Few find it. I always like to think of, well, how wide is the gate? Because broad is the path that leads to destruction. Many will take it. Narrow? How narrow? And I always like to picture Jesus standing there and say, how wide was his shoulders? Because I think that's how wide the gate is. I am the gate. They enter through me. So I like to think, yeah, that's pretty narrow. People don't like that narrowness. And so if Jesus is narrow, they say, ah, that's obviously satanic, that's wrong, that's evil. <sighs> so he calls him to himself, verse 23. Began speaking to them in these parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? How can a guy throw out his self? Grab yourself by the back of the neck and throw yourself out. We'd say, that would be tough to do. Now you can take yourself out, but you can't cast yourself out. If a kingdom, look at verse 24 and 25, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. You ought to underline that, okay? If you're a non-underliner person, you should just write that down. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand or cannot endure, or cannot prosper, cannot be successful, cannot. Our government says you can be divided and accomplish all kinds of things. In fact, we have such far left liberal anarchists today that seem to be able to scream louder than anybody else about their rights. And then if you oppose that, uh, no. You're a racist. You're a person of hate and a person of anger. When in fact, the Christ follower is a person of love. 
You as a Christ follower are the one who has the answer. Is it any wonder they're blinded? They can't see that you have the answer? Because that indeed is the answer. Christ Jesus. Divided here, and then he goes on, and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. You could take house as meaning family, meaning like your uh, large family, your extended family. You could mean house as in your house, your home, your family. If that's all divided, uh, there's a problem. And so the household does not stand. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. How do you know your household is divided? Well, we just celebrated Thanksgiving and all the week. How'd the conversations go? Did everyone express their gratitude and uh, thanksgiving to God for what God had provided and who he was? Did you have some good spiritual conversations? I pray you did. I pray you did. But if you're saying, no, no, we can't talk about that. Why not? Well, because if we talk about religion or politics, the roof explodes off the house. And for some people, that's true. Don't you sense, you know, if you know of that, or that's maybe even part, don't you sense the loss there? Don't you sense that we cannot succeed as a family because we're not unified? And that is same in your family. It's the same in the church. Any kingdom that is divided, which comes apart, which differs, which is disunited, we say, well, differences are good. Not if they're different from God. They're called evil. If you stand in agreement with God, then it's good. If you stand in disharmony with God, then it's evil. Any house that is taken apart or set apart, not only from themselves, but from God, can't succeed. It can't go on. Verse 26. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. I like that too. I like a lot of the Bible actually, as it turns out. Satan rising up against himself, and we'll get to this in a moment as we use an illustration from the Old Testament. The plan of the enemy, Satan definitely has a plan. The demons against God definitely have a plan. They infuse that plan through mankind. They deceive. They subvert. Okay? Deception is out there. How would you know if you're deceived or not? How would you know that? It's easy. It's very simple. Read your Bible. If you differ from that, change. That's called repentance. Disagree with the word of God, repent. Stop disagreeing with the word of God. Start agreeing with the word of God. You see, the people who attacked us December 7th, they could care less about God. They had their own versions of that. Pretty loyal, pretty fanatical. There's lots of loyal, fanatical, hard-charging people who are wrong. Who are wrong. And just because they shout louder or are willing to drive their bomb-loading plane into people or ships does not make them right. It will never make them right. But yet we see that today. We are assaulted by individuals today, and it's always the same. Click on, there's the mob. Oh, it's just a rally. Oh, it's a peaceful assembly. Sure it is. Then that peaceful assembly turns violent. You see, they call that rioting. 
that rioting turns into looting. Now, to date, they skip the whole first half of that. They just go right to looting. Tearing down, stealing, hurting individuals. Uh, the problem with that is that that is totally contrary to the Word of God. He has these rules. They're called the Ten Commandments. We remember them, don't we? Thou shalt not steal. Seems pretty clear to me. Not so clear in our society. Well, you know, if they're poor or they've been hampered or they've been oppressed, then they kind of have a right to come in and steal. That's insanity. That is a person who is out of their mind. The plan of Satan is truly insanity. The plan of the enemy is most certainly divided from God. It has come apart from God. It has come away from God. It has come away from his word. The enemy of God has a goal. But it also has an end. It has an end. Do you think this bad stuff is just going to keep going forever? If you do, don't think that way. That could lead to depression. Anxiety. It's never going to change. That's wrong thinking. The Bible says it'll change. And it can change instantly. Instantly. And I'll give you an example here in just a second. Verse 27, Mark 3. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. A plundering of a home or business or a nation, occurs when it is bound. It is restrained. It is tied up. It is not free, specifically free in Christ. When Mark is explaining these truths, Christ is explaining these truths, no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man. Now the context is actually, because of what we've been reading, that Christ would enter into Satan's domain and snatch away all plunder, bind Satan, and plunder all that he has taken. Taken. Does Satan take? The answer is that's all he does. That's his plan. He wants it all. How much is enough? None of it. It's never enough. You can't give enough to the enemy of God. Hence the people of the world that are controlled by the enemy of God. It's never enough. The context also goes, and the principle goes, if Christ can enter into Satan's domain, bind him, and plunder, take from him, and take to himself. Don't raise your hand. Some of you have been taken from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Some of you have been brought from specific terrible situations and brought to glory, brought, brought to the king. You see, that's because his kingdom, Satan's, has been plundered by our savior. And what drove the stake through Satan's heart is that cross right there. That's what did that. That he would be willing to die for your sins and forgive you. What a grand thing. Some of us actually were sinners before we were saved. The Bible teaches all have sinned. All. All right, were you any worse sinner than the looters? Them vile filth that are destroying our country? Are you, any, are you worse than them or better than them? See, some of you are adding that all up in your head. Uh, God looks at all sin as bad. The sins of mankind are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. The sin of rejecting Jesus his word and his miracles 
will not be forgiven. If you're in Mark 3, look at verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be given, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Now look at verse 29. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Some would say this is the unpardonable sin. This is a sin that the cross doesn't pay for. Well, which one would that be? Casting out demons? Because that's what's going on. No. No. It is, they are rejecting Christ. They reject him. They reject his word. They reject his sacrifice for them. And you cannot go to your grave rejecting Christ and be forgiven. Well, God's a good God. He'll forgive me at the end. And the answer to that through Christ is no, he won't. People in Hades, which is where you go if you're a non-Christ follower, if you're not saved and covered by the blood of Christ, you go to, and most translations just put hell. Kind of an okay word. Talked about it this morning bind the servant head to toe. They cast him into the outer darkness where there is weeping and moaning and gnashing of teeth. Hey, how many want to sign up for that deal? Some people say, well, that don't sound so bad. You know, if you explore outer darkness, if you explore weeping, gnashing or grinding of teeth, if you explore sorrow, if you explore agony and torment and come through all of that, no sane person would sign up for that. None. Not if they believed it was true. That's why many organizations, even churches, take hell out of the Bible. They say, well, we can't have that. That's negative thinking. That doesn't allow for all of the people congregated that want to be living in sin. And we need to say, well, that's okay. God loves you anyway. God does love you. He paid an extraordinary price on the cross for you. But if you reject that, there's no forgiveness of your sin. It is unpardonable. Hosea said that people without understanding are ruined. And that's godly understanding. People who don't understand God, they are ruined. So what's the response surrounded by people who have no understanding? Turn in the Old Testament to 2 Chronicles. I couldn't get away from 2 Chronicles chapter 20 this week. I didn't know I couldn't get away from it. But... <clears throat> Three times, God brought this past to me. Three different occasions, three totally separate events. Uh, this passage came up. Well, when God speaks to me three times, I kind of tend to listen. It's unfortunate it takes three times. But that's just because I have a tiny brain and a thick block head. So, Second uh, Chronicles 20. The king of Judah helps us to know how to defeat those who oppose God. Now in chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles, there's a great multitude in verse 1. Verse 2, Jehoshaphat is the king. This great multitude comes up against Judah and against the king. And of course, they, Jehoshaphat, he sees and hears about the great multitude amassing so he does what sane people do. Maybe I should have, the days of infamy and the insane. Maybe I can insane. Jehoshaphat was afraid, in verse 3, 2 Chronicles 20, turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. King says, you know what? I'm worried. We got a problem. We got a lot of bad guys at the gate forming at the gate, coming to the gate. You know what we should do? Pray. Seek the Lord. 
proclaim a fast. Let's give up those things which distract us from God. So, verse 4, Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They could have said, well, let's go count how many swords we have. Let's go count how many shields we have. Let's go depend on our foreign allies. Isn't it interesting that you can destroy yourself and then turn to others? We're not going to make any oil. See, that's a hot button. We're going to beg our enemies for oil. Somehow that doesn't seem to make sense to me. I just can't figure that out. They came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. All the cities of the area come in prayer. What if we had a citywide prayer event? We have a church-wide prayer event tonight at Lake Spokane Community Church, 6 o'clock. What if the whole city of Nine Mile came to that? What if they did? Yeah, we could even include Suncrest. The other ciders. What if the whole city of Spokane decided they're going to show up for that? We'd say, well, we need to move this from Lake Spokane down to the arena. Because the city identifies the need to seek God and find out what's going on. So they pray. Now in the midst of that assembly, verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Hazael, Hazael and Hazael is a prophet. Doesn't come to the people, comes to the man of God. The man of God, God's going to speak to him. And then he's going to go speak to the people, specifically the king. And so, verse 15, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. There's many preachers today that are proclaiming truth to the people of the United States. And I praise God for the sound evangelical preachers, those who are actually teaching the truth of God's word. That is a wonder. That is an amazement. And we should listen to them. And the, here's the thing. If you take and start listening to what I'll call the norm, I have to paraphrase all of this, normal evangelical conservative, the, okay? We should just be able to say pastors. Unfortunately, we can't just say that, but that's the flavor. They should all be singing the same song. They should all be speaking the same truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes upon them to speak truth to whomever's assembled in their midst. And here's what he says. Do not fear or be dismayed. And of course, we've preached on that for two years now. Don't be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude. <clears throat> and I would like to suggest to you that the great multitude in the United States is not the far left liberal terrorists that are taking over portions of our country. That's, that's a lot of them, but it's not all of them. It's perpetuated as everybody thinks this way. And I always go, who thinks that way? Insane people? Because no conservative, God-fearing Christian who believes in the word of God and the word of truth is going to agree with all of that. They're going to say, no. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this minority in our country. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Soldiers of Christ... Yes, you are. If you're a born-again believer, you are a soldier. Are you involved in warfare? If you're a Christ follower here today, or listening, if you are a Christ follower, you are a soldier. You are placed headfirst into the war effort because there is a spiritual war raging, and you, can, you don't have to go past your arm's length to see it. 
The battle's not yours, however. It's God's. It's God's. So here's what he tells them to do. And I love this. Tomorrow, go down against them. Don't wait. Go out there against them. Behold, they will come up to the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jerel. <clears throat> go. Oh, by the way, let me tell you where they're at. Go here. Specifically, you go here. However, verse 17, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourself. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah of Jerusalem. Second time, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. So we, as Christ's followers, go. That's the operative word. You don't have to sit at your house and worry. Go. Where do you go? You go into your work centers. You go into the community. You go wherever God leads you. Path uh, of business. doesn't matter. Go. Go down there. Station yourself. There's a mes another message that comes out of this is, <laughs> go and stand still. You say, ah. That sounds a hair bit sideways. No. Go out there. Hop. Stop. Stand still. Stop right there. Stand right there in opposition. Stand right there in truth. Stand right there for God. But you're there to stand. So, early in the morning, verse 20, they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. They went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah, inhabitants of Israel, or Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God. I thought that was a little odd since they were already there. Why were they there? The prophet had told them go, so they went. Now the king is saying, Now you're here. You see all of those bad guys. You see how horrible it can be. Put your trust in the Lord. Trust in him, and you'll be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. Put yourself in the hands of God and God's people and follow that and you will succeed. You will have success. Verse 21, when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as he went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and everlasting. You know, it's strange. He doesn't say, hey, gather up a big sword, a shield, a helmet, a little sword, maybe an extra little concealed dagger, okay, maybe a spear. Okay. Arm yourself and get out there and stand. God doesn't say that. Go out there and stand. Okay, Lord, we're here. Now what do we do? Well, that's easy. Uh, sing. Verse 22. <laughs> sing and praise the Lord. Sing and praise. How many battles have you fought with singing? See, maybe we got something a little sideways in our culture today. How many battles where you have sung praises to God when you're facing a struggle and you sing them? You sang today. You sang about the deliverance of Christ. You sang about the joy of his birth. You're singing praises to God. Why wouldn't you do that when you're in trouble? When you see a nation in trouble, people say, oh, this is horrible. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings come. <laughs> they will look at you like, oh, they've lost their mind. Isn't that strange? Go out there, stand still, arm yourself with the hymn book. When they start moving, you start singing. Isn't it interesting that Joshua defeated Jericho? with this very same plan. Praising God, trumpets of God. And so, when he had a council, consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire, and they went before them. Right? So, verse 22, that's what they do. 
and God set an ambush against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. And they were routed. They go out, they start singing. I believe the people sang songs of God. Does it matter what song? No. Song to God. Song of praise. And look what happens. Verse 23. The sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished, the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. What a grand thing. You know the thing about bad guys? If you've got bad guys in front of you, you better think about the bad guys behind you. Because what makes them a bad guy behind you is they could have their spear in your back just as easily as in whoever they're chasing. You can't trust bad guys. That's why they're bad guys. Okay? You can't depend on them. You can't trust them. You certainly can't have them behind you. And so here's one army. Okay, but let's go. Wait, how come you're shooting us? How come you're spearing us? And then, after they get destroying one army, they say, hey, this is all paraphrase. Didn't we do good? Yeah. No, I did that. No, you didn't. No, I did that. And so they sword each other to death. And they kill each other completely. That's what happens to the wicked. God just takes the breath of God and say, be confused. Be out of your mind. They turn on each other. Why? Because they're in opposition. If you'll turn on God, you'll turn on anybody. If you would destroy the word of God, you will destroy the word of man. And what happens when you do that? God turns away from evil. God does do that. Remember Romans, you don't have to turn there, but this is the disciplines, the judgments I think we bear. You've heard me say this several times. Verse 24, Romans 1, Therefore God gave them over in lusts of their hearts to impurity. God says, You want to be immoral? Go ahead. Be immoral. Verse 26, the reason God gave them over to degrading passions. Okay, homosexuality. You want to be homosexual? Go ahead. God turns from them. There is no honor there. There is no mercy there. There is no grace there. And finally, verse 28, as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not proper. Insanity. God scrambles their brains. And that's exactly what we see happening today. A people of insanity, of a depraved mind. I don't expect them to see otherwise. One writer says, for who turns away from God and is prosperous, bad guys who prosper, is nearer to perdition. The more he is removed from the severity of discipline. The farther you get away from God, the closer you get to hell. Origen says, this is the terrible this is the extreme case. When we are no longer chastened for sins, when we are no more correcting, when we are no more corrected, offending, for when we have exceeded the measure of sinning, God in displeasure turneth away from us in his displeasure. Jerome said, When you see a sinner affluent, powerful, enjoying health with his wife and circle of children. That saying is fulfilled. God has turned away from them. You see the wicked doing well, successful and those kind of things. It's obvious God has turned his face from them. And they face the judgment of that pit which they have dug for themselves. Our nation has shown great resolve and great determination. December 8th, Wednesday, our nation decided to show resolve. And it went for a whole year. Then it went four years. See, it impacted the nation. On September 12th, our nation showed great resolve. Unity. We came together. We certainly can do that again. 
determination in the face of tragedy and terror, in the midst of the darkest days, days of infamy, the United States has risen up and for brief moments became united and for even briefer times sought the provision of God. And that's exactly what we need to do today as we start to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Maybe during these days of infamy, we could remind those around us to deeply consider where we are as individuals, where we are as families, where we are as a church, where we are as a nation. We should lead that way with singing, with praises, and then let God work. Let God work. And He will. Amen? In your bulletin, God is working. Some praises that you see there today. You filled out and hopefully...